Subcommittee on Energy will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. Welcome to today's hearing entitled Unearthing Innovation, the Future of Subsurface Science and Technology in the United States. And before I recognize myself for five minutes in opening statement, I would simply note that uh, our subcommittee chairman, Mr. Williams, is under the weather, and I and other members on the Republican side will be tag teaming uh, presiding today over this hearing, and we expect him to be back very promptly. That said, today the Energy Subcommittee will explore the status of U.S. subsurface science and technology research, a field of study that's highly relevant for Americans all around the country, including those in my home state of Oklahoma. Our country has significant subsurface energy resources, and if harnessed correctly, these resources have the capacity to provide all Americans with clean, baseload power and secure energy storage for generations to come. Subsurface science encompasses a broad range of technologies and energy sources, ranging from next generation mining and mineral extraction to advanced geothermal energy and carbon sequestration. A strong understanding of subsurface systems is essential, not only for har harnessing today's resources, but for expanding our clean energy portfolio sustaining critical domestic energy supplies, and ensuring that the long-term storage of carbon dioxide and nuclear waste. Despite significant advances in recent years, the fundamental and applied research in these fields faces unique challenges associated with accessing the subsurface. That's why robust support for subsurface R&D is critical for U.S. energy independence and national security. On the Science Committee, we prioritize the fundamental and early stage research that leads to groundbreaking technologies. And subsurface science is truly one of these areas, a multidisciplinary field of study that maximizes return on investment by advancing several clean energy pathways at once. This is an important segment of our all of the above clean energy strategy. While I look forward to hearing from our subsurface experts here today, I'm particularly pleased to see representation from the U.S. geothermal industry. Advanced geothermal technologies have the potential to transform the U.S. energy sector. Geothermal is a source of clean and renewable energy that is always on. Yet, although the United States leads the world in geothermal power production, geothermal still contributes less than 1% of the total utility-scale U.S. electricity generation. While I've seen the value of geothermal energy in my district with Oklahoma's thriving geothermal heat pumps industry, more work needs to be done to allow the rest of the country to access the full power of this resource. Federally funded research programs at the Department of Energy have a history of paving the way for industry innovation. It is critically important to our clean energy in the future that we have the support they need to pursue research that industry cannot undertake. That's why three years ago, the Science Committee worked to get my bill, the Advanced Geothermal Research and Development Act, signed into law as a part of the Bipartisan Energy Act of 2020. This legislation provided DOE with a comprehensive reauthorization of its geothermal technologies R&D activities, including its Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy, FORGE as some of us call it program, directing DOE to partner with industry and academia to improve the next generation of geothermal energy systems. Just last week, a participant in the FORGE program, Fuhrer Energy, here with us today, you can correct me on that, announced a record advance achievement of an enhanced geothermal system site. I hope that this afternoon we can get a clear picture of the outcome of some of these kinds of investments and recommendations for appropriate next steps. I also look forward to our long, larger discussions that will improve our understanding of the subsurface environment that both DOE and U.S. industry are advancing groundbreaking activities to meet our present and future energy resource needs. Recently, I was fortunate enough to visit Baker Hughes' research facilities in Oklahoma and saw firsthand the potential for industry collaboration and technology transfer between subsurface energy sectors and applications. If we want to ensure a diverse portfolio of clean energy technologies now and in the future, we in Congress should prioritize this kind of important fundamental research and partnership. I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony and I look forward to a very productive discussion. And with that, I now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from New York, for his opening statement. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for convening us here today, and thank you to our panel of expert witnesses for appearing before this committee to talk about a topic that is relevant to several technologies that we must use to enable our clean energy future. Understanding the natural processes of the earth and how we can sustainably harness its resources is essential to human well-being, and a lot of our unanswered questions lay in the rock and soil beneath our feet in the subsurface of the earth. There, too, can be found one of our most promising technologies for building a climate-safe future. Geothermal energy technology allows us to utilize the warmth naturally captured in the subsurface of the earth to produce clean energy. We can even use that heat directly to enable industrial processes that need high temperatures or to heat our homes. Many communities in my district are pursuing the creation of thermal energy networks to efficiently bring geothermal power to clusters of public buildings and affordable housing, which is very exciting. I am pleased to see President Biden's administration embrace geothermal energy, and I'm proud to have joined with my colleagues here on the Science Committee to support efforts to advance the technology. I also understand that there has been a recent breakthrough in geothermal technology development that one of our witnesses here today can talk extensively about, and I greatly look forward to that discussion. Historically, a lot of the subsurface technology R&D supported by the Department of Energy has focused on extracting fossil fuels from the ground. We have learned a great deal on how to harness resources in the subsurface, which can thankfully now be applied to clean energy as with geothermal. This body of knowledge can also help us assess if and how carbon can be safely stored on the ground. But as we work to transition to a new clean energy system, we must build in principles of equity and justice at every step of the process. And I'm happy to see the president focusing on exactly that through his Justice 40 initiative, which ensures that 40% of the benefits from our federal investments, including science R&D, flow to the communities that have been historically hit hardest by fossil fuel pollution. The Department of Energy has also stewarded decades of subsurface research related to understanding natural terrestrial processes, such as the carbon and water cycles, and on applying this science to help understand how Manhattan Project experiments impacted the environment. This emphasis on biogeochemistry and material science not only helps us to understand our responsibility to manage legacy contaminants, but also helps us further the earth sciences in general and their application to climate action. This research that the department supports is part of a global effort to understand and reduce the damage humans are causing to the earth. It is critical that we continue to fund these federal investments in climate science. With that, I want to say thank you again to the chair and to our panel of distinguished witnesses for putting on this hearing today, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Bowman. And at this time, let me introduce our witnesses. Our first witness today is Dr. Alexandria Hakala, a senior fellow for geologic and environmental systems at the National Energy Technology Laboratory. Our next witness is Mr. Ben Surye the Government Affairs and Policy Manager for Fervo Energy. Our third witness, with a much easier to pronounce name, is Dr. Kevin Rosso, the Associate Director of Physical Sciences Division uh, for Geochemistry at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Next is Dr. Hakuro Murakami Wainwright, the Norman C. Rasmussen Career Development Professor uh, assistant Professor of Nuclear Science and Engineering and Assistant Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT. And the last witness is Ms. Allison Brook, Chief Sustainability Officer for Baker Hughes. I now recognize Dr. Hakala for five minutes to present her testimony. Thank you, Congresswoman Bice, uh, Ranking Member Bowman, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on subsurface science and its vital role in understanding and harnessing the vast resources beneath our feet. I'm Dr. Alexandra Hakala, a senior research physical scientist and acting senior fellow for geologic and environmental systems, representing the National Energy Technology Laboratory, or NETL, within the US Department of Energy. DOE plays an essential role in advancing subsurface R&D to secure America's energy future. 
Bringing together experts across scientific fields, DOE is focused on better understanding subsurface systems and optimizing their use to ensure clean and reliable energy sources for the nation. Collaboration between DOE and the national laboratories is essential to drive this progress in subsurface science. The DOE Science and Energy Innovation, or SEI Crosscut, funds research, development, demonstration, and deployment so we can assess, access, and monitor the subsurface more quickly and accurately. These advancements will allow key technologies in geothermal energy, geologic carbon storage, geologic hydrogen storage, sustainable critical mineral extraction, and geologic hydrogen sourcing to become market competitive, scalable, and permanent clean energy solutions. The Office of Science's Advanced Scientific Computing Research and Basic Energy Sciences programs are supporting the fundamental research advancing our knowledge of the subsurface. Meanwhile, the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, or FECM's, Carbon Transport and Storage Program has supported projects like the Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnerships, which conducted field tests to safely store more than 11 million metric tons of CO2 and laid the foundation for regional initiative and commercial scale projects supported by the Carbon Storage Assurance Facility Enterprise, known as the Carbon Safe Initiative. Funded by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, Carbon Safe pairs with the Carbon Basin Assessment and Storage Evaluation, or Carbon Base, and Carbon Storage Technology Operations and Research, Carbon Store Initiatives, designed to advance each stage of carbon storage resources and projects as the CCS industry is implemented over time. The Carbon Transport and Storage Program also invests in small-scale CO2 injection and research on storage through mineralization. It's currently assessing potential storage resources in surface and subsurface locations nationwide. Proof-of-concept studies are being conducted in volcanic basins and offshore basalts, exploring unconventional storage resources to support regional decarbonization goals. Two multi-lab initiatives, the National Risk Assessment Partnership, or NRAP, and the Science Informed Machine Learning for Accelerating Real-Time Decisions Initiative, or SMART, are working to reduce the uncertainty associated with geologic carbon sequestration. Meanwhile, the Energy Data Exchange, or EDX, maintains all data from the Carbon Transport and Storage Program, including NRAP and SMART tools, and enables users to find and apply relevant data for carbon storage analyses. EDX works with other agency databases to provide comprehensive access to subsurface data. These resources support site selection, risk analysis, and decision-making processes. Finally, I want to emphasize the significance of our critical minerals and materials R&D and their potential to advance sustainable mining practices. The subsurface holds significant reserves of critical minerals, often inaccessible due to depth or mining limitations. Many of these unminable mineral resources can be unlocked using advanced subsurface imaging, detection, drilling, and fluid handling technologies. The minds of the future will harness these advanced technologies, allowing for the extraction of mineral wealth with minimal surface and environmental impacts. As FECM's national laboratory, NETL's R&D efforts align with this vision of a sustainable and environmentally responsible mineral extraction industry, strengthening America's position in critical minerals production. At the same time, the Office of Science, primarily through the basic energy sciences, is supporting fundamental experimental and theoretical research to understand the basic properties of critical minerals and materials. This enables the development of enhanced extraction, separation, and processing methods, as well as discovery of substitutes for critical materials that will perform equally well or better in the technology applications we rely on. So thank you very much, committee, through the collaboration uh, for this opportunity to speak. And I'd like to highlight that through the collaboration between the DOE offices and the national laboratories on these and other efforts, we are at the forefront of developing sustainable and efficient solutions for subsurface resource utilization and contributing to the nation's energy security, environmental stewardship, and technological leadership. Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss these cutting edge innovations, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Hakala. And next up, I recognize uh, Mr. Sarurier for five minutes for his testimony. Thank you, Representative Bryce, uh, Ranking Member Bowman, and members of this committee for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Ben Sarurier. I am the Government Affairs and Policy Manager at Fervo Energy. We are developing enhanced geothermal systems to deliver 24-7 clean electricity. Our approach to EGS leverages drilling advances from the natural gas industry to increase production, reduce risk, and produce cost-competitive power from hot, dry rock. Harnessing domestic resources, literally the heat beneath our feet, with American-made equipment, 
and a homegrown workforce that pulls directly from America's world-leading oil and gas industry. Geothermal is a complete energy security solution and has a major role to play in the future electric grid. This hearing is taking place at an opportune moment. Last week, Fervo announced a major technological breakthrough, proving that enhanced geothermal is commercially viable and ready to scale. In removing the remaining technical barriers to expanding geothermal, America is in position to dominate the global market for this high potential clean energy resource. This breakthrough reflects the important technological progress that has carried geothermal to this stage and shows the way forward towards realizing its huge potential. Enhanced geothermal today is in a similar place to the natural gas industry roughly 15 years ago on the cusp of the shale revolution. EGS benefits from the technology, experience, and skilled workforce of pure subsurface industries and it will also benefit from following their commercialization pathway. Following the shale playbook, the next phase of innovation in geothermal will come from project standardization and modular development, driving down costs through learning and deployment. Fervo has demonstrated the effectiveness of EGS technology, and we now have the opportunity to perfect it. The Department of Energy and its national labs have been instrumental in pioneering the technologies and techniques that enabled first the shale gas boom and now breakthroughs in EGS. Expanding these research and deployment investments in geothermal is critical to meeting clean energy goals while safeguarding grid reliability, strengthening domestic energy security, and creating high paying jobs in manufacturing and subsurface development. In May, Fervo's commercial scale pilot project in Northern Nevada produced 3.5 megawatts of geothermal energy and established itself as the first EGS project to achieve commercial viability. This breakthrough signifies the official commencement of what is likely to be yet another American-led energy revolution. Now, the key in tapping geothermal's potential is through optimizing our subsurface approach in the same way natural gas development utilizes standardized well design to reduce drilling time and increase production. Fervo has already finished drilling its first well at a new field in southwest Utah for a plant that will total over 400 megawatts and come online before the end of the decade. And we're already seeing this learning curve in action. Across our four drilled wells, we have accomplished an 18% improvement in drilling performance. This indicates that greater cost reduction is yet still achievable. Federal support for early stage R&D has been instrumental in reaching this milestone, and federal support for demonstration and deployment will be just as important in sustaining progress. Historically, funding for geothermal has lagged other clean firm energy technologies, despite its recent progress and large benefits per invested dollar. To that end, we are eager for the DOE Geothermal Technologies Office to invest its allocated funding from fiscal year 2023 appropriations for EGS demonstration projects. While America is well positioned to lead the geothermal revolution, other countries are catching up. A single $100 million grant from the European Union to a project in Germany is by itself $16 million more than the bipartisan infrastructure law provided to divide across all US projects. And China's most recent five-year plan on renewable energy development includes a prominent role for Chinese geothermal development and generation. The US must capitalize on its comparative advantage in subsurface technology, advanced manufacturing, and project development and by increasing investment in EGS research and deployment, will catalyze a wave of American-built geothermal across the globe. The shale gas revolution has shown us what is possible when the, geo when the government agencies, national labs, and universities work together with industry to invest in subsurface exploration. That journey of technological innovation, commercial entrepreneurship, economic abundance, and energy security is now continuing in geothermal. Now that EGS is proven, Optimizing this technology through standardization and modularity will deliver affordable and reliable clean energy and jumpstart a globally significant American industry. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Sourier. And at this time, I recognize Dr. Kevin Russo, Rosso, excuse me, for five minutes for his testimony. Mr. Rosso, you're recognized. Thank you very, thank you very much, um, Congresswoman Bice, Ranking Member Bowman, and members of the subcommittee. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Dr. Kevin Rosso, Associate Director of the Physical Sciences Division for Geochemistry at the, at the DOE's PNNL, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I lead a team of about 35 researchers on a range of topics, like predicting rates of CO2 mineralization in the subsurface for storage, the chemical transformations of nuclear waste for processing, 
and the transport of hazardous materials in the subsurface. We focus on understanding the reaction mechanisms at their core to help make more reliable predictive models. I'll make two main points today. The first is that environments below ground are complex, and it's difficult for us to see everything that we need to see to be able to readily bring new energy systems online. But the good news is that areas where we need technical innovations are clear. The second is that to truly enable success at large scales will undoubtedly require a sustained multidisciplinary effort between national labs, universities, and industry, the kind that we just heard about. Enabling meaningful partnerships is important. So let me summarize why. Uh, first, it goes without saying that the subsurface has so far been meeting most of our essential needs. As a clean source of energy, uh, as a source of energy, clean water, raw materials for construction, and critical elements. And we're really quite good at finding and unearthing these resources with relative ease. But we now hope to tap its abundant heat for clean geothermal energy. We also want to use it for energy storage from intermittent sources such as wind and solar, and for disposal of hazardous materials like excess CO2 and radioactive waste. To do these things at large scale safely, efficiently, and with minimal environmental impact brings new challenges. Pilot projects demonstrating promise have been exciting to watch unfold. This includes PNNL's Walula CO2 injection pilot in Washington, showing rapid carbon mineralization um, in basalt below ground. And just recently, Fervo Energy's successful well test that we just heard about, which is fantastic. The subsurface is structurally and chemically complex, and we have limited ability to see important features or predict their physical and chemical responses to change. To create an enhanced geothermal system, for example, requires that we accurately drill deep into hard rock and there create an interconnected and permeable fracture network between wells through which fluid can easily be circulated that brings up sufficient heat for sus uh, sus sustainably for years. All the while, we've got to avoid triggering earthquakes, losing fluid, flow, or heat transfer over time. It is the need for predictive control and long-term reliability that makes it a new ballgame. Mastering this at the national scale requires that we learn how to overcome the many uncertainties involved in subsurface engineering, going beyond what industry can achieve alone. The DOE has been proactive in cultivating and supporting research to help fill critical gaps. Examples include its SubTIR initiative launched in 2014 that identified ad adaptive control of subsurface fractures and fluid flow as the core objective. A year later, the Geosciences Program of the Office of Basic Energy Sciences led the report Controlling Subsurface Fractures and Fluid Flow, a Basic Research Agenda, to define the fundamental research needed to actually achieve this goal. But to be honest, we are, now, we are just now getting underway with the R&D effort. Some of these research priorities were recently featured in funding opportunities from DOE's Energy Earthshot Initiative, to which PNNL responded with a multi-institutional team to develop novel signal detection methods that could enable real-time monitoring of the state of stress between boreholes for enhanced geothermal. But this is just one small piece of the larger team science effort truly needed to ultimately get us from explorers to masters. As research continues to on-ramp, I'd also like to emphasize the importance of keeping our R&D infrastructure at the bleeding edge. Key to this effect is ensuring that new and advanced experimental and computational capabilities continue at our national labs, universities, and DOE national user facilities. This will help keep us at the forefront and help us attract and retain top talent. To conclude, Though largely overlooked, the subsurface provides most of the critical resources sustaining our present way of life, and it's now poised for the foundation <coughs> to be the foundation for our future. But our ambition to use it in new ways is a grand challenge requiring a lasting commitment to basic and applied research. Thank you for the opportunity to provide the committee with information on this topic. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Rosso. And at this time, I recognize Dr. Okuro Murakami Rain Rainwright, uh, for your testimony, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Representative Rice, Ranking Member Bowman, and the members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. As a researcher at MIT and previously at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and University of California, Berkeley, I have been involved in DOE's subsurface science-related programs for the past 15 years. I have conducted interdisciplinary research on such topics as water resource, soil and groundwater remediation, carbon dioxide storage, permafrost science, and nuclear waste disposal. 
The subsurface plays a critical role in our society. It provides much of our energy, as well as critical minerals needed for many parts of our economy. Groundwater is an important source of water for drinking and for industrial and agricultural use. The subsurface also provides spaces for isolated storage of nuclear waste, carbon dioxide, and others. My research has been focused on developing and applying statistical methods and artificial intelligence to improve the characterization, monitoring, and prediction of dynamic subsurface processes. The DOE Office of Science has a long history of supporting the development of subsurface modeling and simulation capabilities, taking advantage of the latest generation of high-performance computers and software libraries, which were developed through the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program. As a result, today, scientists can simulate thermal, hydrological, mechanical, chemical, and biological processes and their interactions within a detailed model of the subsurface. DOE's user facilities and observational sites are also essential resources for subsurface research. The user facilities have been used to discover vast and novel microbial communities in the subsurface and to visualize flow processes and chemical reactions in rock pore structures. The observational sites have enabled us to rapidly develop and test subsurface sensors and imaging technologies. Science, scientists can now map rock properties several hundred meters deep over an entire watershed and rapidly detect subsurface anomalies. The capabilities developed by DOE's base, basic research programs in subsurface science are proving their value across the agency. The Office of Environmental Management is using the sensor and simulation tools developed by the Office of Science to improve long-term groundwater monitoring at DOE's legacy sites, ensuring the stability of remediation systems while lowering their cost. Long-term sub long subsurface simulation capabilities also support the spent nuclear fuel disposal program under the Office of Nuclear Energy which requires waste isolation for longer than 10,000 years. The Office of, Office of Science is increasing its investment in the use of artificial intelligence in subsurface research. This rapidly evolving field has already made it possible to find patterns in very large data sets and has accelerated simulations. In 2021, I co-organized the Artificial Intelligence for Earth Systems Predictability Workshop, which explored how AI should be incorporated across the Earth Systems Modeling Program. I believe that DOE can make a unique contribution in this topic, having great strengths in both computing and observation capabilities. Another promising new area of research is the use of local subsurface sensors to improve environmental monitoring in regions where mining, waste disposal or storage, or other commercial subsurface activities are underway or under consideration. These are often in rural places that are far from scientific centers. STEM education and community science programs could be built around these data sets from sensor networks empowering local communities to monitor and protect their own environment. In summary, DOE programs support work at the national labs and in academia and play an essential role in advanced subsurface science and technologies for various applications. They are improving our ability to take advantage of subsurface resources and to minimize and remediate any environmental impacts. Thank you again. I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murakami Wainwright. And finally, we have, uh, Dr. I'm sorry, Ms. Allison Book, uh, who uh, is recognized for five minutes for her testimony. Thank you to each of the members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to, to, to address you all today and for your efforts to highlight the importance of subsurface sciences. My name is Allison Anderson Book, and I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for Baker Hughes. I'm also a trained geoscientist. I oversee our corporate sustainability program and drive the company's energy transition. My team supports our growth areas that include carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, and geothermal. 
through focused research development and demonstration activities. We work to identify public partnerships, consortia, and other opportunities for enabling the scale up of our technology and services. Subsurface science and technology is used today to characterize subsurface for energy production and natural resource extraction to determine the best sites for waste disposals, many people here have said, and numerous other applications. Federally funded R&D programs have supported real innovation in each of these areas and remain essential today. We see three key areas where we need subsurface R&D, and it remains critical, that is CCS, hydrogen storage, and not surprising, geothermal, as we've heard on the committee today. CCS is a critical energy of research as it's essential for reducing emissions within the energy steel, cement, and petrochem sectors. We're active throughout the entire CCS value chain from project design to post-combustion capture, compression, subsurface storage, and long-term integrity and monitoring of a reservoir. Hydrogen storage is an emerging area of focus thanks to new funding from hydrogen hubs and the Section 45V tax credit. Important work remains to understand how to safely control and monitor geologic hydrogen storage, as well as robust and reliable sensors are needed for the subsurface monitoring. Additional geothermal R&D is needed to further develop the enhanced and advanced geothermal systems, as well as production of geothermal energy from oil and gas wells. Last year, we helped to launch the Wells to Watts Consortium to repurpose oil and gas wells at the end of their productive life for geothermal energy. We're using test wells at our Energy Innovation Center co-located at the Ham Institute for American Energy in Oklahoma City. This is where we simulate high temperature subsurface environments for testing closed loop system for many different kinds of well configurations. We validate engineering performance models and provide scale for field pilot efforts. The Department of Energy and its various programs provide an essential function for facilitating American technology development, and we have long history of collaboration together. Our key R&D areas have included enhanced geothermal tech, novel additive manufacturing approaches, and gas and flow sensors and monitoring technologies. We're also involved with the Carbon Safe Program projects at the, of the, at the Office of Fossil Energy, and that collaboration is instrumental to our long-term CCS strategy, particularly in the subsurface. I'd like to underscore three challenges for your consideration here today as you look to build upon American leadership in this space. First is the need to sustain, if not, uh, not expand, uh, support for each of these programs. A stable private, or excuse me, a stable federal program produces stronger, broad-based partnerships with the private sector and accelerates innovative scientific progress that would be difficult to achieve in isolation. Additional funding is most needed related to high temperature downhole sensors and drilling technology for geothermal wells. Funding for geothermal at similar magnitude as enjoyed by the CCS program under CarbonSafe as well as DOE's hydrogen hubs would enable the industry to bring crucial new technologies to scale. Second, I respectfully ask you to consider whether policies around intellectual property should be adjusted to reflect the difference between early stage R&D and later commercial demonstration projects. Current policies establish government rights to subject inventions that occur pursuant to grants. And this is reasonable <laughs> when the government directly funds the R&D leading to, to this subject invention. The intention of demonstration projects, however, uh, is not to develop new inventions, but rather to scale up existing technology. So it's a different purpose. These technologies may include prototypes that are modified during the course of construction and testing, but were developed entirely by the private sector. Negotiating to overcome a department's rights in this context can create challenges for equipment manufacturers who would otherwise uh, own the, the IP. So my last point as, as the clock winds down, we understand this lies, this last point beyond the committee's jurisdiction, but I wanted to raise section 174 of the tax code, which since 1954 has allowed companies to deduct their R&D expenses in the same year in which they were incurred as an incentive to encourage investment in domestic R&D. As of January 2022, companies must now amortize these expenses over at least five years or more if it's international making it more expensive to invest in R&D in tighter market conditions like the ones that we see today. So we urge you to pass legislation to reinstate the immediate deductibility of R&D expenses. 
Thanks again for the opportunity to present this testimony and share our views here today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Spook. And I would just add, um, I appreciate you uh, mentioning the Ham Institute for American Energy, which is located in Congressional District 5 Mine. So thank you for that. Um, at this time, I uh, thank all the witnesses for their testimony, and I recognize myself now for five minutes for questions. Both the University of Oklahoma and Oklahoma State University have been heavily engaged in research partnering with the Department of Energy to better model potential geothermal sites, assess how the utilization of abandoned oil and gas wells can lower costs for geothermal energy producers, as well as improving fluid hydraulics and enhanced geothermal systems. These types, this types of research have had the potential to make Oklahoma a global leader in geothermal production while exporting these technologies around the globe. Um, Dr. Hakal, if I could start with you, um, how does the DOE's uh, how does the DOE plan on further supporting academic partnerships in these areas? Well, the Department of Energy has uh, a huge focus uh, with the subsurface energy innovations crosscut. And so part of that is making sure we can leverage mm -hmm. knowledge and understanding across all of the different offices within the Department of Energy. Um, that also involves, involves working with the national laboratories and academic partnership is part of that effort. Um, part of the Energy Earthshots in Initiative includes uh, government academic partnership opportunities moving forward. So there, uh, the expectation is that there will be opportunities in the future to, to look at that. Dr. Russell, would you have any um, sort of comment on that as well, those partnerships? I'd have to say that uh, on the topic of um, the project in Oklahoma that was referenced, I, I can't speak to. But uh, the, the partnerships are in incredibly important, particularly between national labs and universities. Um, and the, um, the, the initiative that Dr. Hakala mentioned is, you know, it, it's got its roots, I believe, in the Subter initiative of DOE, and it's continuing on in this new life, in this uh, revived form today. Um, and it's, it's great. It's, it's exactly what we need. Um, maybe more writ large, I would say, but it's, yeah, it's a very good topic. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Surya, you have highlighted the potential for enhanced geothermal systems moving forward and the great breakthrough that your company has recently made. How have partnerships with academic institutions uh, made these types of innovations possible? Thank you. It's a great question. And it's our company is made possible because of partnerships between industry, national labs, DOE, and academia. Our co-founders met um, in different programs at Stanford University, and so really it was born out of an academic institution. And so when we look to do research that's applied, we're often partnering with a whole bunch of technical schools when we apply for funding from DOE for grants. A lot of that is joint between sorry, you know, School of Mines, University of Oklahoma obviously has huge opportunities here, Oklahoma State has a center for excellence. So there's a lot of different schools, UT Austin, I, the, the list goes on, but it's that they bring a lot of experience and knowledge. We bring a whole bunch of uh, sort of entrepreneurial perspective on what's going to be commercially important. And that combination pushes science forward that then allows it to be applied and, and grow in the marketplace as well. Do you think that um, in, in some ways we have to be careful about sort of fragmenting um, all of this research across so many institutions that it kind of may have um, sort of a negative impact and that it's, it, the, the focus is lost in some ways? I can understand the concern, but I would say coming from the, the geothermal industry, frankly, has been historically fairly small and, and funded at a fairly low level, mm -hmm. and, and being spread thin is potentially a concern, but more is always better. And so when we can bring more, you know, different genetic diversity, so to speak, in an intellectual sense, to the problem, it can only lead to good things across, especially across the many cross-sectoral applications that we can see for geothermal. So I'd say it's a yes and situation with, with R&D and deployment in geothermal right now. Perfect, thank you for that. Um, another research effort at Oklahoma State, uh, funding was awarded for the university to work with both the Oak Ridge National Labs um, and the Pacific Northwest National Lab to expand the deployment of geothermal heating and cooling tech. Dr. Russell, you sort of um, alluded to this briefly, but um, the, you know the the role of academics, I think, um, specifically for your uh, NTCs, has a significant role. Would you would you agree with that? 
Uh, nominally, I would, but to be honest, I'd be guessing. My, my side of the house at PNNL is very fundamental basic research. There's an applied research section that I, I believe has the connection that you're talking about with Oklahoma. So just to be, you know, full disclosure, I, I can't really elaborate on this particular topic. Um, but, but just a general yes of enthusiasm about the collaborations that have already been, you know, the focus of your question, really. Perfect. Yeah. I appreciate that. And at this time, uh, I will... Uh, Yield my time and now recognize uh, the ranking member, Mr. Bowman, for questions for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, my first question goes to Mr. Sororier. Uh, congratulations on Furrow's recent breakthrough. Uh, in your testimony, you cited work completed by DOE and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory on the prevalence of geothermal resources in the United States. There has been much success in the Western states with current geothermal techniques and technologies, including your company's recent groundbreaking success in Nevada. However, there are numerous geological differences between the rock formations under our feet in Washington, D.C. today and those under Western Wells, like your company's Project Red. What needs to be done in terms of technological advancements to ensure that eligible geothermal resources here in the eastern portions of the United States can be tapped? Thank you uh, for the question, Ranking Member Bowman. It, this is the exciting thing that we're super you know, uh, excited about it at FERVA, which is that with this advancement that we've shown in Northern Nevada, the ultimate goal is geothermal everywhere. And what needs to happen is we need to learn how to do it better because we know it works, but now we need to do it cheaper, we need to do it faster, and we need to do it at scale. And so the deployment of geothermal energy technologies will bring the cost down and that allows us to go into new geologies and to do them cost effectively. It's not dissimilar from what the growth pattern we saw in oil and gas, which started at the low hanging fruit. And then as the, mature, the technology matured, we saw new resources. We brought those new technologies to bear in new areas and discovered new opportunities for economic production. The same opportunity exists in geothermal. And ultimately, our goal is to commercialize where that low-hanging fruit exists. It's true, the West does have an abundant, shallow heat resource. But the East Coast, you dig down, you find heat, right? And so now it's about getting those drilling costs down, finding the technology to optimize the subsurface reservoir that allows us to do it in every possible uh, geologic foundation. What should DOE be considering to speed up the demonstration and deployment of these enhanced geothermal systems? It's a great question. There's a lot of opportunities here. So one thing that we're particularly excited about is um, the funding that can be that has been appropriated that, that could be spent on actually funding demonstration projects that are actually, you know, putting drill bits in the ground and seeing how these uh, projects work in practice, but also thinking about ways that we can optimize those types of formations. Uh, we brought up, uh, Forge was mentioned, the Forge project is, is a great project. We partner with them on a lot of opportunities and seeing how they are pushing the boundaries on what these reservoirs look like, how they can be operated in more flexible ways um, for electric generation or for a whole bunch of multi-uses, applying that research in the ground because we're at the stage where we're ready to deploy and we need to learn how to do that deployment faster. Got it. My next question is for Dr. Hakala. One of the most energy intensive actions a building can do is heat its air and water tanks. And enhanced geothermal systems become more commercially, as, excuse me, enhanced geothermal systems become more commercially viable, there's great potential to use these technologies to provide heat to large buildings and individual households. Many communities in my district, in Westchester County, in the Bronx, in New York, are looking at these systems, as I mentioned in my opening statement. So how can enhanced geothermal systems be used to lower energy costs and decarbonize the building sector? Thank you very much for your question. Unfortunately, that's outside of my area of familiarity, so um, I, we can get back to you with an answer on that. Uh, okay. We do have colleagues across NETL and FECM who have information on that topic. Can I go to Ms. Book then next? Thank you. Sure, I was ready for this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so actually, you know, I, I don't want to get the stat wrong, but we, um, in the U.S., residential and commercial sector accounts for about 17% of gre U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, I focus on that since I work in the energy transition. And building heating is a really big share of that, right? So the focus on that is appropriate uh, and, and a lot more can be done. 
to answer your question, one thing that we've done uh, at Baker Hughes is we have partnered with a company called Exergo. And this is a company, it's a clean tech startup, so it's a little bit earlier. It's, I would make a, a comparison that where Fervo is gone and it's going big. Uh, uh, Exergo is looking at this with CO2 as the heat recovery fluid. Okay, and so this this means you're able to use excess CO2, and so get at emissions reduction at the same time that you can you can have a low temperature fluid loop for geothermal, which is really exciting and very cutting edge. And so this is an area we'll want to see a little bit more investment in, so that so we can see that investment take off. But that's a really great application where you get emissions reduction and some really excellent sustainable um, heating and cooling. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member, and it is my great pleasure to recognize the Chairman of the Full Committee, Science, Space, and Technology, my colleague from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Book, in your testimony, you highlight how Baker Hughes, alongside industry and academic partners like Oklahoma State University, is using technology originally developed for the oil and gas industry for emerging technologies in geothermal and carbon capture and storage. Can you go into more detail on how the investments made by the oil and gas industry are vital to the development of other subsurface energy technologies? Yeah, so a lot has been done in the subsurface and in sort of the tech and the service side. And so just as, as we've heard from the gentleman from Fervo, a lot of that um, the technology piece is, is well baked in the oil and gas side, okay? And a lot of it directly transfers. So a lot of what we are doing on, on, in geothermal today is directly uh, same kind of equipment that you might use. Now, the frontier space needs technology that can go hotter and hotter, okay? as well as lower temperature is a little easier. That's a direct translation. I, I'd also say it's the same as you start to look at CCS in terms of the storage side for CO2. And, and a lot of the drilling techniques, same, same idea. Controlling a well is the same. And so it's, it's, what's great about this is, is a direct translation of both the tools and the, the skills that people have into this different frontier. Do you think we would have seen the rapid development in these technologies without the contributions made by industry? I don't. I mean, a lot of the innovation comes from there, but also in a, this public-private partnership, right? And so, so you've seen uh, companies like ours in partnership with the U.S. government and the labs working over time. Like, I think it was Sandia who came up with the first PDC bit many years ago in partnership with the private sector, okay, because they have the application space where they're really advancing that. Mr. Saray, in your testimony, you described the partnership between Fervo and DOE's Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy and the role it played in the advancement of enhanced geothermal technologies. Within this partnership, what were the benefits to Fervo? Thank you, Mr. Lucas. It's a great question. Forge has been a great partner of ours. And the benefits that we saw, first of all, we had a great view into the rock because of their experience drilling uh, in Southwest Utah, but also to have a community of researchers who are dealing with the same challenges of taking oil and gas technology and applying it in a new geologic formation. There were a lot of unknowns and to have the Forge uh, success story, and they also have had some recent breakthroughs in their own project, to have their experience translate into our ability to raise capital, our ability to apply that capital to a new development, and to start pushing the boundaries on, you know, taking, they can take some risks with their, uh, with their project, which frankly uh, is harder to do when you have the private backing that we do. And by the same token, in all fairness, what, do, what would you describe as the benefits of this to DOE? The benefits to DOE is helping uh, the American grid decarbonize, create uh, a ton of new jobs, and pioneer a whole application of subsurface uh, development and technology that wouldn't be feasible without these sorts of partnerships. One last question. What specific recommendations, if any, do you have for Forge moving forward? My recommendations for Forge is to stay close to their phone because we love to call them. But also, uh, it's, it's to look at the, you know, when you, when you think about where this industry is going, the application of EGS, to think about we're applying these at large scale. Forge has a couple great wells. We're looking to do a 400 megawatt project nearby. And to think about the application challenges that the private industry will be facing as we scale up from an industry that is nascent 
but as I mentioned, on the cusp of very rapid growth. And so there's scaling challenges, there's application challenges. Those are new world of scientific inquiry, uh, and, I, and I look forward to working with them uh, to help solve some of those challenges. Thank you very much. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I recognize Ms. Lee for questions for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Bowman and to our panel uh, of witnesses today for your time and your testimony. Western Pennsylvania, where I represent, has been home to mining operations for over 200 years. And of course, that's not been without consequence. Uh, black lung, an incurable respiratory uh, disease, has become more prevalent as impacting younger workers earlier across the post-industrial Appalachian communities. Uh, while I'm a strong advocate and supporter for a clean energy future that does not rely on fossil energy, I'm also obligated as a representative of my people to ensure that every individual is carried along as part of our energy transition. Every member of this committee represents families who are concerned or affected by the changes they see and feel in their environment. Uh, it's vital that we continue to push for new technologies and strategies, and not just for energy security, but for better welfare and living standards for our constituents. The continued extraction of energy resources from the earth creates numerous fears within the communities I represent. Uh, millions of structures in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania stand on top of old and abandoned underground mines. In fact, uh, my constituents are often advised to purchase subsidence insurance in case their homes ever cave in. Uh, there are an estimated 230,000 homes in my district at risk of sinking into the ground from mine subsidence. Uh, powering our homes and industries should not and must not mean that parents uh, go to sleep worrying that their home may literally be swallowed uh, by the ground. So this is why I'm proud that uh, Rep. Bice and I have been able to work together to introduce the Abandoned Well Remediation Research and Development Act, which will further support research and development into the subsurface environment and help reduce methane emissions from abandoned mines across uh, the country. So not to sound like a, a, a radio hit on repeat, but some of the worst air quality in the country is found in my district. It means a lot to me that I sit in this seat to affect change uh, to my community and communities I represent. Legislation like this is one step in the right direction towards cleaner air and PA. Uh, I'm also intrigued by the opportunities that advanced computing and complex modeling will create in mapping abandoned mines and wells to better plan and protect our communities from harmful emissions and geological uh, abnormalities. It's important to me that research and development into how we interact with subsurface energy sources caters to the safety and well-being of our fellow human beings on the surface, along with remembering that we share this planet with all the flora and fauna, and we are all obligated to protect such as well. Uh, with that said, uh, Ms. Book. How are researchers at organizations like your own utilizing their research to create technologies and devices that protect our family, or excuse me, our frontline workers from occupational diseases like black lung? Well, typically that's not as associated with our part of the energy sector, right? And so, but we're, uh, we have a really big focus on safety. And so uh, I, I actually sit on top of all of the statistics for our company's performance in that area and uh, in terms of, uh, the people, planet, and principles. It's a part of our sustainability reporting and, and accountability to the communities we operate in. And so we take that very serious. In fact, we measure perfect health safety days uh, to ensure that our frontline workers are protected. And so uh, I, can, I can assure you and point you to the, the things that we do in more detail offline, because there's quite a bit that, that we do. Thank and you. We partner with communities. Yeah. Certainly, I appreciate that. Um, Similarly, many communities in my district struggle with domestic wastewater treatment due to the leaching of metals from abandoned mines into watersheds. Um, if anyone knows how is research and development helping create cost-effective solutions for municipalities, such as improved detection or prevention of contaminants from abandoned subsurface infrastructure? I will give that to you, but if others have input. I, I don't have any answers, so. Yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank, Dr. Okada. thank you so much, Representative Lee, and thank you for representing Allegheny County. It's where our, I'm up at the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, NETL site. Um, so I can say that um, some of the research that's being performed at NETL and across the Department of Energy is focused on taking um, what they call unconventional feedstocks, and so that would be something similar to some of these wastewaters from abandoned mines and figuring out um, how to clean the, how to clean them up, and then also how do we extract valuable minerals from those from those uh, resources? 
And so um, that, that type of work spans from the basic R&D stage all the way out to some technology deployments that are being tested in some other regions, but that would be applicable mm -hmm. um, to, to our region as yes. appropriate. Thank you, Dr. Hakala. W really quickly, one more. You know how DOE um, R&D working to incorporate public feedback and community engagement to adequately address air quality and public health concerns in our communities? Well, DOE is, um, as, as part of all of these ex, uh, larger uh, projects that are um, funded to look at carbon storage and, and, and direct air capture and things, um, as part of those external opportunity announcements, there is an opportunity for, uh, or there is a request for the teams re responding to those to include a community engagement plan. And so that can include outreach, education, um, and, and any type of involvement with the community as appropriate. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Lee. And at this time, I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Keene, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, Dr. Wainwright, uh, MIT collaborates with Savannah River National Laboratories on the Advanced Long-Term Environmental Monitoring Project. How is this partnership informed future remediation of contaminated groundwater? What other insights um, has come from this project? Um, yes. So um, one of the biggest challenge for DOE is the long-term stewardship of these sites. Mm -hmm. And there are so many technologies available, including new sensors, uh, AI, artificial for intelligence, for example, but it has not, they have not been integrated into the DOE's remediation program. So Artemis project, uh, we are trying to integrate these technologies to improve the long-term monitoring. For example, rapid anomaly detection at these sites, uh, ensuring the uh, st stability of the system, and really sort of providing the communities that the information that these sites are safe and provide information to make them feel safe. That's, that's the ultimate goal. Okay. Uh in what ways is the collaboration for the development of the next generation workforce? Um, yes, in our project, there are many students uh, from different universities, um, more than five universities. Um, many of them are from minority serving institutions and we are teaching them how to do um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, for example, uh, we are teaching simulation capabilities, and we are, um, yes, uh, um, developing the next generation workforce for EM, but also beyond EM, uh, general environmental industries. Okay. And then I've got a, a, a broader question to any member on the panel that would think is appropriate to answer. Um, when considering the importance of having multiple energy sources to help the U.S. move towards energy independence, what potential regulatory barriers or other barriers are there that might hinder the growth of enhanced geothermal energy production and utilization? Uh, I'll be happy to take that, that first. Thank you, uh, Mr. Keene. One area is public lands management, honestly. There's 90% uh, or so of America's geothermal resource as currently recognized. It's on federal owned land, and so the permitting process, uh, the lease sales, and the uh, in-house expertise at the various permitting agencies is a critical um, component of our ability to expand uh, the technology as, as fast as the market is demanding it. I'll jump in on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm all for the... Um, Enthusiasm and, and learning by doing approach to things like enhanced geothermal. And we, we have some very good success stories that have been featured even in this discussion. Mm -hmm. But if I bring it back to the, the question about safety and the need to kind of drive carefully through this, uh, you know, there's, there's cautionary tales here. The, the fundamental R&D that, that is needed to sort of ensure safety, to ensure that we know what we're doing as we establish these pilot plants is, is ultimately very it's critical to actually keeping the whole industry from actually undermining itself with accidents such as induced seismicity or, you know, creating a, a reputation of not in my backyard would ultimately be something that would be an inertial drag on the entire enterprise. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that there's, there's a complementation to all of this with fundamental R&D on, on the subsurface the, the complexity that I referred to in my, in my mm -hmm. testimony. There's, there's things that we still don't know when you're drilling into deep, hard rock trying to do things that are really challenging, like enhanced geothermal. 
You, you don't know how stressed those rocks are that you're drilling into. You really don't know at the very beginning what's going to happen. And so uh, the, the research that is needed really at, at the fundamental level is things like new sensing technologies, um, the things that are being developed like to try and understand reactive transport of fluids through stressed rock and fractures. Uh, these are really fundamental challenging questions that re require an incredible collaborative team of multidisciplinary folks to, to, to wrap their heads around these problems and help pr produce predictive tools. So I, I just want to make sure that's clear. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. Anybody else in the panel? No. I'd, I'd just like to highlight that a lot of the lessons learned from the other industries is, can also be very important in also extending it to figuring out how, you know, what are areas that we already know about versus what are areas that require some more of this focused investigation. Okay. That's great. Uh, thank you. And uh, I yield back. Thank you. And at this time, I'd like to recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Ross, for five minutes for the questions. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the chair and the ranking member for holding this hearing. And thank you to all the panelists for joining us today. One of the most important societal issues we face today is a shift to a carbon-free, renewable energy distribution system and, and really harnessing what we've got in nature to do just that. And this is essential to limiting climate change and obviously subsurface um, resources provide a patchwork of solutions for this energy transition, including enormous amounts of pore space to permanently absorb carbon dioxide and renewable energy from geothermal sources. Last summer I had um, the great pleasure and privilege of going with a bipartisan delegation to Iceland to see um, how they use geothermal energy and to see some innovative carbon capture technology, some of which was being done between Iceland and the United States. Um, I'd like to know, because nobody's talked about Iceland here, I mean, obviously we don't have, you know, volcanoes like they do, but um, how much of what you do is um, based on the amazing success that they've had in Iceland? And I think we'll, we should start with Dr. Hukula and move on from there. Great, thank you very much for this excellent question. And um, th what this points towards uh, for me is I'm trying to understand um, how can we both recover geothermal energy and also trap CO2 uh, in a mineralized form. And so the US Department of Energy is looking at mineralization R&D across a variety of scenarios, both looking at above ground and, and in situ or, or within the geologic reservoir and how do we trap this CO2 as a, a immobile phase. And so um, there is still some fundamental R&D required in that space, especially depending on the formation and depending on specific flow pathways and properties. Um, however, being able to understand what's happening in, in currently deployed field settings uh, and where, where things are, where CO2 is being injected and then coupling that with the fundamental R&D is, is critical to figuring that out. Does anybody have anything to add? Yeah, I would just like to add quickly, um, thank you for the question. Direct air capture is something that we're very interested in at Fervo, and, and Climeworks, one of the direct air capture firms, I believe it is, in, in Iceland that pairs with geothermal. It works really well because you have the need for high heat for direct air capture, as well as the need for low cost, steady, clean electricity. We produce both of those things. And so we're looking at what those partnerships could look like if we integrate an EGS system with a direct air capture system. And a lot of that's modeled off stuff that's being pioneered right now in Iceland. So it's great to have that working model for us. Great. Um, and, oh, did you, uh, Dr. Rosso, did you want to? Want... It's okay. I, I was just quickly going to add there's exciting things going on, similar to what's going on in Iceland, but in, in the Salton Sea in California, where basically you've got geothermal, you've got the heat at the surface, but, but you can also extract metals. You can extract lithium. Lots of other important critical elements are coming out. It's just fantastic advances in R&D going on at, at sites like that. So in certain ways, I'd say we're, we're trying to keep up with what's going on internationally. Great. Um, and the, my next question is really about our energy grid for energy distribution. And so we've seen that with solar and wind, we're going to have to make some upgrades to our grid to deal with um, either, particularly with offshore wind, um, an entirely new way of getting that energy to shore and to our homes and to our businesses. And then we've seen this unbelievable queue in solar where we haven't been able to tap into this amazing resource that we have because we simply don't have the distribution system. What do we need to do to our energy grid to be able 
able to get geothermal energy on it in an efficient way and not have the grid be the thing that stands in the way? Thank you. It's a huge question. And um, I think transmission is going to be a huge piece of that. We're developing projects in places. We have some flexibility in siting, but geothermal to date has been a relatively small share of our energy grid. And so there isn't necessarily the same amount of a s installed transmission capacity to the areas where we see the most exciting development opportunities. But in addition to that, I'll note that geothermal, because it is a 24-7 clean firm resource, enables the development of a whole slew of variable renewable resources. So you have that really cheap solar and wind power coming online, but you're also adding flexible baseload power in geothermal that can play a critical role in keeping lights on and keeping everything affordable. So the portfolio, but the transmission access is going to be important. Okay, with four seconds to go, does DOE have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, we have, I have uh, many colleagues who are looking at this question across the Department of Energy. Um, I can get some additional information from them. Unfortunately, it's not my area of expertise. Okay, thank you, and I'd yield back. Thank you. The Chair, now recognize Mr. Baird for, from Indiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and I always appreciate uh, you witnesses taking the time to share er your expertise with this committee. Uh, you know, ag's my kind of my background, and earlier this week I introduced H.R. 4824, the Carbon Sequestration Calibration Act. There's a name for you, but anyway, a bill that authorized the Department of Energy to carry out terrestrial carbon sequestration research and development which we've referred to here uh, in collaboration with key federal agencies like the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Department of Interior. So, Dr. Rosso, in, uh, in your opinion, and based on your decades of experience working in DOE Office of Science Lab, what role does basic research in biology or environmental systems science play in DOE's other subsurface science activities specifically related to carbon sequestration? Thank you, Chairman Baird. It's an excellent question. Um, I'll, I'll try and respond on two fronts. Uh, one, one is uh, terrestrial carbon sequestration. There you're basically trying to enhance the amount of carbon that soils can take up. And, and one concept there that's, that should be evaluated is, is how can we take advantage of biology uh, and um, uh, the, the entire ecosystem of soils basically to drive carbon deeper into the just basically for, for longer term storage. And, and that's something that I think the Office of uh, BER, I believe, Biological and Environmental Research, has an interest in. Uh, on the flip side, back to the other point, carbon sequestration below ground, deep below ground, in other words, taking CO2 and injecting it safely below ground. Uh, th this is an important area that can't be overlooked. It's, it's been mentioned by Dr. Uh, Hakala, and um, th this is something that still needs a lot of research. We, we need to understand how we can safely keep it underground, and, and one of the things we do at PNNL very well, because we're sitting out there on a mile of basalt, is to try and take advantage of the fact that there's reactive minerals in basalt that will react with CO2 and convert it into stable solid phases. And so th this is an area that, that we should really continue to keep on the forefront because you know, a large part of the country has got a lot of storage capacity for permanent sequestration of CO2. You know, you mentioned one thing that I think is important in this because of agriculture and what they've done over the years in conservation. Uh, you know, the carbon adds, adds another uh, activity to the soil and improves soil health. And so the more of that we could capture in the soil, the better off we would be. But Dr. Hakala, can you... Um, I want to go to you next uh, if you'd like to comment about this. Sure. I Thank you very much. And I, I agree with um, Dr. Rosso's uh, r response. Um, there is some fundamental research that does happen across the DOE labs. And, and what's really important also is the um, leveraging the knowledge that we gain in different program areas and applying it uh, towards a specific application. And so... Uh, with this question of um, what do we need to understand about en enabling terrestrial sequestration? Well, is there are there fundamental advances in geomicrobiology that we can leverage to further enhance carbon sequestration in the soils um, and, and in other types of reservoirs like the deep subsurface? Would any of the other witnesses? Yes. 
Um, so um, I have worked in uh, many projects under BR, Office of Science BR. BR supports uh, research, for example, developing mathematical models, computational models, to uh, simulate and predict the carbon cycling in terrestrial system. Those capabilities can be directly applied for this uh, carbon sequestration in soil. Uh, also, they support research to map soil, soil heterogeneity over large area, and they also support uh, carbon, carbon cycling experiments. Those type of research in BR can be directly applied to uh, agriculture setting uh, for so, um, carbon sequestration in soil. Thank you. Anyone else? Care? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to put on a hat from a former life. The As the token geo, geoscientist sitting here, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the USGS and the US Biological Survey are powerhouse in this area as well, okay? And so so let's just remember as you work on, and I, I haven't looked at your bill yet, but I, now I'm going to, okay? Because because they, they have a lot to offer and they've done great work in the last decade on assessing the capabilities and where we can have some of the strongest terrestrial sequestration across the US. I thank all of you, and uh, with that, I'm out of time and yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Mrs. Sorensen from, excuse me, for Sorensen from Illinois for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member Bowman, for convening this hearing and our witnesses for appearing before us. Um, in Illinois, 54% of the energy that we use to power our state is nuclear generated electricity. Illinois is the leader in nuclear energy production. This is a clean and reliable source of energy that has worked so well for my state. However, nuclear power does create waste, and currently we do not have a central location for the country's nuclear waste to be stored and disposed of. The solution we have gone with is simply storing the waste at temporary storage sites at or near the generating reactor. This is not a long-term solution and generates environmental contamination concerns. Sites where nuclear waste is stored must be monitored very carefully. Activities which rely heavily on the expertise derived from subsurface research and technology development. One of Illinois' nuclear reactors is just outside the Quad Cities, a community that I represent. Drs. Wainwright and Rosso, are there new developments in subsurface science that we can better protect our communities that live near these facilities? Um, I go first. So I teach nuclear waste management at MIT. I was hired last year to teach this subject. Um, and nuclear waste, I would say, is one of the best managed waste in human history. It's protected by a highly engineered barrier system. And also, um, we, there, are, there are many regulations to uh, protect the environment. Um, I would say uh, there can be many technologies transferred from EM domain in a sense that EM uh, DOE, uh, Office of Environmental Management, have so much experience moving uh, defense-related waste, monitoring uh, these waste. Um, I, I um, manage a project developing monitoring technologies. There are so many new sensor technologies, artificial intelligence for um, um, anomaly detection. So these technologies, new technologies, monitor in particular, can be transferred to secure nuclear waste as well. Yeah, it's a great question, Con Congressman Sorensen. Um, being in Ellis Park, right next to the Hanford site, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we, we um, you know, we deal with a lot of contamination just, just up, upstream from us on the Columbia River. Um, it's, uh, it's an area that EM has taken over in terms of um, uh, you know, let me back up. They actually are responsible for cleanup of that site with its thousand or so plumes of contamination slowly making its way down. Um, but uh, the R&D effort is largely there as well. And um, it, it used to be something that was a, a, a focal area of the Office of Science. But it's, to be honest, it's, it's, it's actually waning a little bit. Uh, and it, it's hard to explain why. It's above my pay grade. Why exactly? Maybe it's political largely. But... 
the point is that there's a lot of left off uh, questions that haven't been addressed in terms of trying to understand how radionuclides move through, the, through soils and subsurface uh, environments. And um, EM is in a, a mode where they fund research for cleanup. They fund the Deep Vado Zone, for example, which is billions of dollars a year, some of which p and um, you know, leads for, for DOE. But uh, the fundamental R&D is, is just not there. It's not there where it used to be. And it would be great to see that pick up again from the office of science. It, you, you'd mentioned that perhaps some of the problem here is political. Could you explain that? I, I cannot. It was just a pure speculation, and I'd love to back that off if I could, but I can't. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Uh, I've only got a minute left. Um, as a nation, we're investing in carbon capture technology. Um, but there's questions uh, based on safety and sustainability. Uh, Dr. Hakala and, and Ms. Book, um, either one of you, um, do we know enough in the geology to know that this is 100% safe? We can flip for it. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. So, you can go. so uh, just being, being fast on my feet, uh, I would feel safe with this, like, in my backyard if the system's designed correctly, okay? Great. And so, and I say that because there's been long-standing use of CO2 in the subsurface many, many decades, mm -hmm. 40 years plus, okay? And so knowing from that, you can't really cite fatalities from it. There's not a body of, of real big safety concerns that come off of that because the storage of that, its use mm -hmm. in oil field recovery and through pipelines has been very heavily regulated, as well as from the safety paradigm, very tightly controlled, okay? And DOT FEMSA provides a really good uh, oversight mechanism for CO2 and pipeline. And so I think in terms of the subsurface, um, the decades of safety experience there uh, is, is well in hand and I think very under control. Dr. Hakala, are, I know I'm running short on time. Do we know enough? Are we monitoring below the surface enough? Well, we have a few major things in our, to our advantage to ensure the safety is. We have the regional partnership, the regional initiatives, uh, the carbon safe efforts, the, the pending efforts. We have the national risk assessment partnership, and we also have the SMART effort. And so when you think about some of the fundamental to applied work that's happening through NRAP and SMART, um, NRAP is looking at um, how can we quantify the risk of a site so that way you can make good decisions about what type of site you want to develop. And so that's built off of years of the labs working together, the years from the oil and gas industry experience, and pulling in new knowledge from, from sites uh, uh, that are under de the demonstration sites. Um, with the real-time monitoring and, and application of computational tools and AI, we're going to be able to understand what's happening in real time so that things that may have been a problem in the past won't be a problem because you can deal with it faster. So I think we're, we're in a really good position to ensure the security and safety of these systems. Thank you for that. Chairman, I yield. Thank you, Chairman. Yields back. I now recognize Ms. Fushi from North Carolina for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Bowman for convening this hearing. And welcome and thank you to all of you for your testimonies today. I am proud to represent North Carolina's fourth congressional district, home to Duke University in Durham, where last year researchers and students drilled a 400-foot hole on campus to study geothermal potential across the university's campus and the region. So my first question is for Mr. Sororier. Much has been said about geothermal energy in the western part of the United States. What technological advancements need to be made to tap into eligible geothermal resources here in the eastern part of the country? Thank you, Congresswoman, and uh, it's great to hear about the progress uh, at Duke. Uh, my brother-in-law attended, and I'm sure he'll be happy to hear that. I, uh, I, I think there's a, couple, there's a lot of different ways that geothermal energy can be used in many different applications. What we're doing at Fervo is digging about 8,000 plus feet deep into super, what would I think normal people consider super hot. It's considered less hot for geothermal energy purposes. But that's a technology that we are ready to deploy today in the West, and deploying it in the West will bring down those costs so we can access deeper resources in less understood geologies in the eastern half of the country. So it's something that can be applied from a technical perspective across the country right now. 
as we get better drill bits, as we get better sensing of the subsurface and more data about where those thermal resources sit in different geologies, particularly in the eastern side of the country, then we'll be able to access economically uh, to develop uh, power generation, heating and cooling, uh, industrial heat applications. The world is our oyster at that point. Thank you for that. And Dr. Rosso and Dr. Rainwhite, um, you both discussed how DOE has been proactive in supporting subsurface research and development in, um, to fill critical gaps. What are the biggest challenges that must be addressed to advance the field of geoscience and its applications? I'd come back to sensing, subsurface sensing. We need new tools that basically give us orthogonal information to traditional sensing tools like seismic and distributed temperature and acoustic. Um, we need to be able to see the, the state of stress in rocks be, before we drill into them so that so we don't create problems like slippage on a, on a pre-existing fault. So it's, um, I, I would throw it at sensing, uh, developing new technologies, in, innovating really, not just um, incrementally advancing existing technologies, but coming up with entirely new ways to, to sense the state of stress in the subsurface. This, this would be one frontier that I would point out. Dr. Greenway. Um, I, I totally agree. I would say that long-term predictability of surface, subsurface is a grand, grand challenge. One of the challenge, uh, biggest challenge is uh, subsurface is heterogeneous, and we cannot see it unless we drill wells. Uh, so, yes, sensing technologies and imaging technologies between wells, uh, 3D visualization of uh, subsurface is rapidly developing. Uh, that, that is a great area. And also uh, coupled processes like heat, water, chemistry interact each other, and those, those processes are very difficult to model. This is another grand challenge. And the DOE has supercomputers, the world's first is supercomputer, for example. Those, those computational resources are really powerful to predict these complex processes in subsurface. Would anyone else care to comment? I'd love to add from our perspective, and probably Fervo, uh, is that we'd like to see more and more uh, focus on pushing the heat front frontier in terms of the tools. So you're always limited when you hit a certain temperature profile, uh, the tools will start to fail if it gets too hot. And so that's been a barrier that's been very difficult to cross in the history of geothermal and subsurface exploration. And so I would say that. And then downhole sensors is an area that, that we can always work to advance more, particularly on that heat frontier as it gets hotter. Did you want to add anything? No, I would just add that, that we do have the technologies to deploy today, and iterating and building on those technologies in new conditions becomes even better for the resource. So we are drilling at heats that are commercially productive. We are seeing fiber optic sensing work in those conditions. The drill bits work in those conditions. But to make this the fully realized resource that it can be, that geothermal can be, will require going to higher, deeper depths, higher heats, and obviously doing that more economically with better technology is gonna make that more feasible. Mr. Chairman, that's my time, I yield back. Thank you. Um, the chair now recognizes Mr. Fleischman from Tennessee for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to this distinguished panel. It's always good to see you all. I'm Chuck Fleischman, I represent the people of the third district of Tennessee, uh, more specifically the great city of Oak Ridge, located in Anderson and Roan counties and that wonderful DOE reservation. Um, appreciate you all participating today. Uh, in my district, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is conducting research and development on a variety of areas surrounding these subsurface technologies. For example, DOE's Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program, known as OSCAR, has seen a major recent success with the deployment of Frontier at ORNL, the world's fastest exascale computer. From rare earth mineral recovery and reuse efforts to developing advanced materials for geothermal well construction and operating the country's largest open access battery manufacturing research and development center, the national labs are a key player in our country's energy future. Dr. Rosso, can you explain how the national labs 
utilize funding to fill gaps that private industry may not be able to invest in during early technology development? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> Let me talk about computing. Com computing at, of the kind of uh, and scale that's available at Oak Ridge, such as the leadership class exascale computers, are, are totally essential to, to what I've been referring to all along, and that is d developing new ways to actually detect and, and see below the surface between boreholes. So it's uh, that aspect that you mentioned is, is important. Um, with regards to your other question, which I've already forgotten, I, I don't know if you'd be kind enough to repeat that so that I can Yes. Direct it. How national labs utilize funding to fill gaps that private industry may not be able to invest in during early technology development? Well, it, it's all about establishing um, collaborations between the experts that exist at national labs and universities. And, um, yeah, and, and giving them real resources to actually dedicate time and attention and, and the development of, of students on these topics, right, for the next generation workforce. So that, that's essential. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Hakala, can you give us some examples of how technologies initially started in a national lab have evolved into commercially successful enterprises by private industry? I think, uh, thank you very much for that question. And the one example that I'm most familiar with is where there was a significant investment in understanding directional drilling and hydraulic fracturing technologies. And that some of that fundamental research that was performed uh, years ago has then has now been applied and deployed in, in multiple regions, uh, you know, for unconventional oil and gas, and more recently it's being explored uh, and, and applied in geothermal as well um, to, to look at the technology leveraging across different technology spaces. Thank you. I know my time is waning, but Dr. Wainwright, how have high-performance computer supercomputers transformed your research? in environmental remediation and understanding the subsurface? Um, yes, um, I, my team routinely use high performance computing for groundwater simulations. For example, we, are a, we were able to quantify the impact of extreme weather events on EM sites. Uh, there are many concerns about how extreme rain events would impact dispo waste disposal cells or some of, let's say, Oak Ridge site, for example. So yes, the, these uh, supercomputers are really helpful uh, for us to model these impacts on groundwater uh, contamination or disposal cells. And we can see, uh, we can predict the future uh, consequence if there are. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to try to get this question in, and I'll open up for whomever wants to answer. After the Bureau of Mines was dissolved in 1996, statutory authority for mining R&D was transferred to the Department of Energy. While there are mining technology-related research efforts run through NETL and RPE, there is no active federal program focused on R&D dedicated to hard rock mining and new mining technologies. Can any of you comment on the importance of R&D in cre creating an economically viable domestic mining industry, and what role, do recommend, what role do you recommend the federal government play, including the national lab system, as we just discussed, in supporting advanced mining technologies? Thank you very much for that question. I'm happy to start the answer to that. Um, something that is happening across the Department of Energy uh, currently is the Critical Minerals Collaborative, and so that is focused on leveraging our past investments, leveraging all of the prior knowledge, leveraging knowledge from the Critical Minerals Institute, and then making sure that there's a coordinated effort to develop the supply chain. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment? I know I'm past my time, Mr. Chair, but if anybody else would like to briefly comment, I'm open. Yes. Um, um, in terms of the waste management side, um, Office of Environmental Management, Office of Legacy Management have been managing uranium mill, mill tailing sites, for example, building uh, stable, uh, stable disposal cells. Those technologies and experience could be transferred to the uh, general mining area. Excellent. Thank you. And again, I thank this distinguished panel. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Chairman yields back. Seeing no other questions, I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for the questions. The record will remain open for 10 days for additional comments and written questions from members. The hearing is adjourned. <laughs>